Blessings Church, this is Audrey Costello Paharsing. I will be reading from the New International Version, Luke 3, verse 7 to 18. John said to the crowd coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We of Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of those sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the shafts with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O God, open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, and our hearts that we may understand, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Recently I came across um, a reading which was called A Perfect World, and let me share a couple of thoughts with you from this reading. In a perfect world, people would feel as good at 50 as they did at 17. And they would actually be as smart at 50 as they thought they were at 17. In a perfect world, you could give away the crib without getting pregnant. In a perfect world, professional hockey players would complain about teachers being paid contracts worth millions of dollars. In a perfect world, the mail would always be early. The check would always be in the mail and it would be written for more than you expected. In a perfect world, potato chips might have calories, but if you ate them with dip, the calories would be neutralized. In a perfect world, every once in a while at least, a kid who always closes the door softly would be told, go back and slam the door. Well, we don't live in a perfect world, do we? And that's why every Advent season, we are confronted with the claims of John the Baptist. John appears in the wilderness, proclaiming that message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same message, by the way, which Jesus gave at the beginning of his ministry. Now, John comes to us every Advent, and he challenges our complacency and our hypocrisy and our security, and he certainly challenges our preconceived notions of religion. Back in the 1960s, the late Canadian author Pierre Burton wrote a book called The Comfortable Pew, and it was a scathing critique of the mainline churches of the day, especially the Church of England, the Anglican Church, but it really crossed all denominational barriers. The only problem with the book was that it was mostly secondhand research because Pierre Burton did not spend much time in church pews. But he did get the title of the book right, 
the comfortable pew. Many people back in those days, and even today, sit in pretty comfortable pews in the church and probably need to be shaken up a bit. I remember the first church I served in was a, a three-point multiple charge in a rural setting in Nova Scotia. And one of the churches was a, a country church that was um, built in the old meeting house style. It was, the building was built in the early 1800s, and I'm convinced people were smaller back then because the pews were the most uncomfortable I ever sat in. The backs were very short, and, and the seats actually sloped slightly toward the floor. So if you were predisposed to nodding off during the sermon, you might find yourself on the floor at some point. They were not very comfortable pews, but some people do need to be shaken up. Sometimes God needs to move us beyond the comfortable pew. The Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard once told a story about a vandal who broke into a department store late one night. The interesting thing is he didn't steal anything. But what he did was even worse. He went into the jewelry department and he switched all of the price tags. So priceless pieces of jewelry worth tens of thousands of dollars were now marked down to a dollar or two or five. And cheap costume jewelry was now priced at thousands of dollars. And the next morning when shoppers came in, there was complete chaos. Kierkegaard said, that's what the gospel does. The gospel switches the price tags. Up becomes down, down becomes up, black becomes white, white becomes black. And to prove his point, he says, look at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus switches the price tags in that sermon. He talks about loving our enemies, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, not judging others. The, the price tags are completely switched around. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, today we encounter once again John the Baptist in the wilderness. Before we can get to the joy of the Christmas season, we have to encounter John out in the wilderness, and it's not an easy journey. In fact, it's rather perilous, because John is this fiery, intimidating character, and he's almost the antithesis of Dale Carnegie and his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. John was trying to influence people, but clearly he didn't care about winning friends. John would always tell it like it is, as the saying goes. John was not afraid to speak out against the religious leaders of the day, called them a brood of vipers, a bunch of snakes. It was not for the faint of heart what John was talking about. It was pretty heavy stuff. The Dutch painter Rembrandt was a talented artist. He married a, a prominent Dutch girl, and he became quite wealthy through his art portfolio. But later in life, tragedy struck. He lost three of his children that died, and eventually his wife passed away. And Rembrandt, toward the end of his life, his paintings were not as well known. And Rembrandt himself, through some bad financial dealings, was almost bankrupt at the end of his life. Nowadays, his paintings are worth millions of dollars, but not so when he passed away. But one of Rembrandt's last paintings was a painting called The Return of the Prodigal, and you've probably seen it. It's this picture of the prodigal son kneeling at the feet of his father, and the father has his hands on his, the prodigal's shoulders, and there's this wonderful pose of grace and forgiveness. And Rembrandt saw that painting as autobiographical. Rembrandt himself believed he was the prodigal in need of God's grace and love. Well, John is calling us to return to the Father. He's calling us to repentance. John was an Elijah-like figure. 
You remember the Old Testament prophet. And Jesus even refers to John as Elijah in a way. And he talks about the day that would come, the day of the Lord. In Malachi chapter 4, we read these words, He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Those are the last words of the Old Testament. The day had now come, said John, the day for repentance. Well, once again, we are faced with the pointed and challenging words of John the Baptist. And what can we take from his teaching once again this year as we approach the Christmas season? Well, in the first instance, I think we need to embrace the power to change. The gospel calls on us to transform our lives in God's power. In Luke chapter 3, he talks about this biblical word, repentance. Luke 3.8 says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Paul Tillich says that some words of faith cannot be replaced. And one of them is the word repentance. The Greek word metanoia, the word repentance, occurs about 50 times in the New Testament, and it always refers to turning around, to transforming one's mind. Gypsy Smith was an evangelist born and raised in a a gypsy camp and converted as a teenager. And Smith was invited by General William Booth to join the Salvation Army. Smith preached around the world. And one time, a Dutchman was converted in South Africa through Smith's preaching. And the next morning, he got up and went to a neighbor's home down the street. And when the neighbor opened the door, this man had a watch and said, do you recognize this watch? Well, yes, my, my initials are on it. I lost it eight years ago. How did you get it? Well, said the man, I stole it. But I was converted last night, and I have brought it back. If you had been up, I would have returned it last night. That man knew the true experience of repentance a turning around, and a transformation. Many Christians just want to accept their personality flaws rather than go through the hard spiritual work of interchange. We give up too soon. We don't believe we can change or that God can do a new work in us. John the Baptist is a symbol to us that we can be changed by God. As the scripture says, with God, nothing will be impossible. Next, John teaches us about the nature of God's family. Again, verse 8 in our scripture today, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. John was especially hard on the religious leaders of his day. You see, they thought of themselves as righteous and not needing repentance. They had no interest in changing the direction of their lives. Some of them simply came for more religious observance, to see what all the fuss was about out by the Jordan with John. Their hearts were not in it. They believed they were already in the club. They claimed their Jewish ancestry. They thought they were okay. Abraham was their father. But John says, no, you need to turn back to God. Out on a limb is an expression we often use to describe something that is risky or dangerous. When you leave the trunk for the branches, things become a little more precarious in a tree. 
John went out on a limb. He redefined God's family for us, that it's more than just ancestry. It was a matter of the heart, of turning to God in faith and true repentance. John redefined God's family as those who had turned back to God, the fellowship of the forgiven. Thirdly, John models for us the life of service. Look how very practical he is in verses 10 through 14. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than is prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. You see, John challenges us to live lives of practical service. Mike Iaconelli was a popular writer a generation ago. He was founder of Youth Specialties, a Christian leadership organization that worked with um, young people and next generation ministries. He died in a tragic car accident 14 years ago. But he once wrote a magazine article referring to the words of John the Baptist. And here's what he said. The church must repent because thousands of people are being turned off the gospel. What is the cause of this mass turnoff? Not Satan, not drugs or alcohol, not suggestive music, not the new age, not secular humanism, none of these things. What turns thousands of people off the gospel are Christians who are focused on stars. The greatest service we can do for God is to quit trying to convince the world that Christianity is true because Jesus somehow makes us prettier or happier, thinner, wealthier, more successful or popular. It is not our job to convince the world of how great and successful and influential we are. Our job is to simply lift high the Christ who took the form of a servant and humbled himself. Well, Iaconelli's words echo those of John the Baptist today, don't they? Advent is a call to wake up and to realize that the world doesn't revolve around me. It's not about us. It's about God and discovering his will for our lives. So we are faced with a challenge of sorts today, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. What will this mean for you this Christmas season? Well, I hope your Advent and Christmas preparations include some time for introspection, to think about this season and your relationship with God. Maybe you need to heed the call of, God, of John to turn around, to come back to God. It is possible to change. That is what the gospel is all about, the power of God to change us. Some of us need to embrace God's family. Growing up in a Christian family or simply attending church does not make you a Christian. You need to connect with Christ in a, a personal relationship where he becomes your Savior and Lord. Maybe you have drifted in your faith walk. Maybe the fire that once burned brightly in your heart has become only a few embers. I encourage you to fan those coals and rekindle your passion for the Lord 
in this season of Advent. And some of us, of course, need to model our lives after Jesus' example of service. We need to get out of our comfortable pews. We need to stop sending the message to the world that our faith is some kind of health and wealth gospel. It's not about how successful or wealthy or well-respected we are. Rather, it is about serving, following the example of the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for, as a ransom for many. May the words of the prophet be fulfilled in us today. The final words of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And then the end of Malachi, he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. May it be so this Advent season and always for us. Amen.